bet I missed that. Okay, so got to know those seven uh, well, diatomic compounds. All right, good. All right, so those are our diatomic elements. So if we look at our first equation here, lithium hydroxide, formula for lithium hydroxide, and yo. LiOH, good. Okay, those are solid plus. They're added to a solution of sulfuric acid. Leto, what is the formula for sulfuric acid? Almost H2SO4. Lithium sulfate. Suzanne? There we go. And water. Okay, there we go. All right, so if you don't have your periodic tables out yet, you should get your periodic tables out. They'll help you, right? They're going to help us out. Okay, so once we got our equations, we just got to balance this. And Brady, how should I balance this equation? Okay, so I'm going to put a 2 in front of lithium hydroxide. There we go. Uh, so we've got two lithiums on each side now. We've got one sulfate on each side. Uh, let's see about hydrogens. We've got four on the reactant side. And we only have uh, two on the product side. So that's a problem. So what else should we do? Uh, not the sulfuric acid. H2O, there we go. And now I think we're good because we got four hydrogens on each side and we've got two of those oxygens outside of the sulfate. We're good. Okay, so we got a balanced equation. What type of reaction is this? What? Maggie? Double replacement. Double replacement. Uh, it's a special type of double replacement, though. No, it wasn't. Double replacement was easy. What? Well, uh, not necessarily titration, but acid base or neutralization is what I'm looking for. Yeah, neutralization reaction. Right, we got our hydroxide, which is our base, reacting with sulfuric acid, which is our acid, and it produces water and a salt. Okay, so we got neutralization there. All right, let's go to the next uh, next one here. Copper metal. So CU solid. It's <clears throat> placed in a solution of uh, silver nitrate. What is the formula, Robert Falconer, of silver nitrate? AgNO3. So silver is one of those transition metals, but it is always <laughs> plus one. Okay, it has an oxidation state of always plus one because it falls in line. So if you look at aluminum, it's got plus three. Zinc is plus two. Silver is always plus one. So silver is one of those transition metals that oftentimes you don't need to have the Roman numeral. Okay, so same thing with zinc. Zinc is always plus two. A lot of times they don't put the Roman numeral because they do not have multiple oxidation states. Right? Unlike like vanadium or something like that, that has plus three, plus five, plus seven. Okay, and you gotta denote with the so here with the name, we just have silver nitrate. Okay. No Roman numeral, even though it is in transition metal. If you put it in there, it doesn't matter, it's not wrong either. Okay, so we form silver crystals. G and copper one nitrate. Right, so I'll C U N O three. Uh, what kind of reaction is this? Single replacement. Good job. Okay, single replacement. Uh, is it balanced? Yes, we're good. Okay, last one here. 
aluminum, and hydrochloric acid. React to form aluminum chloride. What's the formula for aluminum chloride? AlCl3. Good job, Michael. And hydrogen gas, so H2. We got to balance. What are we going to do to balance this one? Very good. Yeah, very good. Okay. Nice job. Okay, so I know I kind of moved pretty quickly to that. We're going to get into the stoichiometry now. All right, so this is a great way for us. So with stoichiometry, we're going to use a balance equation, right? Okay, and we can relate anything in that balance equation to each other here between the mole ratio. All right, the mole ratio in the balance equation is going to help. We, if we know anything about any of the substances in a balance equation, it could be grams, could be you know, how many atoms we have or whatever, okay, as long as we have the information about that particular substance, all right, we can convert it into moles. We can relate it to anything else in the balance equation. All right, that's how we can bridge the, bridge the gap there between anything in the balance equation. So if you look at that kind of diagram, the one that we're always, like, the most common pathway, right, is this one right here, going from grams to moles to grams again. So kind of going back and forth between those things, right, because we're always, no matter what, stoichiometry involves the mantra of get into moles, mole ratio, get out of moles. Okay, it doesn't matter what you have, you got to get into moles, use the mole ratio to get into something else, and then get out of moles. Right? That's all it boils down to. Get into moles, mole ratio, get out of moles. Okay. Get into moles, mole ratio, Get out of moles. Those three things. All right? So it's three steps. That's the maximum number of, well, not the total maximum, but it's usually the maximum number of steps you're going to need to use. Okay. So here we go. So we're going to use that last reaction there that we were that we just uh, balanced there with aluminum. Reacting with hydrochloric acid. We just did this one. Makes aluminum chloride. And hydrogen gas. No yawning. Two. Six. Uh, what is that? Two. Three. Okay. So that's our reaction that we had. And they want us to calculate the number of moles of HCl required to react with 0.87 moles of aluminum. So the nice part is we're already in moles. So we just have to mole ratio. Okay. So 0.87 moles of aluminum. And we only have to mole ratio because they only want moles of HCl. <clears throat> so what do I put in my little equation here? How do I set this up? Yeah, Allie? Okay, so the moment equation there is six. So as everybody see where those are coming from, right? We've got two moles of aluminum, and we've got six moles of HCl. There we go. <coughs> and then we just take it down here. 0.87 times times six divided by two. All right, so 2.61.
Okay, so we get the same answer that is up there, which is great. Okay, same answer is the key, so we're good to go. All right. Okay, that was pretty straightforward. Let's work on uh, the next one here. We'll do one more, and then we get into the be about this workout, okay? All right, so solid lithium hydroxide is used in space vehicles to remove exhaled carbon dioxide from the living environment by forming solid lithium carbonate and water. All right, so we got lithium hydroxide used in space to remove exhaled carbon dioxide, so plus CO2, by forming solid lithium carbonate. Li2CO3 and liquid water. <clears throat> Those, what do I got to do to uh, balance this? Okay. The two there. So again, I got two lithiums on either side. I've got two hydrogens. I've got two, uh, four oxygens on the left, and I got four on the right. I've got one carbon on each side. Okay. Here we go. All right. Sweet. Okay, so we're done. Um, we want to know what mass of carbon dioxide can be absorbed by one kilogram of lithium hydroxide. So first of all, I guess my question is, how many grams are one kilogram? Thousand, right? So there are thousand grams equal to one kilogram. All right, so I'm just going to start this problem off with a thousand grams of lithium hydroxide. So it's something to think about here too, is if you look at the map that we just had, we're looking at, okay, we're starting in grams. Right, and they want us to solve for grams of something else. So, notice how many arrows there are. There's one, two, three. Okay, so if we go around, there's three arrows there. So that means we got to go three steps. Right, we're getting into get into moles, or ratio, get out of moles. All right. So we just have to kind of fill in the blanks here. So I got thousand grams of lithium hydroxide. Got steps. And I'm solving for grams of CO2. So I just got to fill in the steps to get there. I'll give you guys a second to try to do that. What's the mass of lithium hydroxide? Is that 30, 25? 23.5. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
Okay, so so hopefully you get you came up with something like I have here on the board, where I got grams of lithium hydroxide mole. So I'm using molar mass, right? Grams cancel out. Then I'm left with moles of lithium hydroxide. Those cancel out. Moles of carbon dioxide cancel out, and all I'm left with is grams, and that should come out to be 919. Okay. And I only got 10 minutes left, so I just want to make sure that we get after the last problem here, some of these limiting reactant problems. Okay, so how would you describe these guys? Limiting reactant, excess reactants. What is a limiting reactant? Yep. Okay. Now first, so it gets all used up. All right. Limiting reactant gets all used up by the reaction. So the excess reactant is what's left over, right? Okay. That's what's left over. Uh, do you guys remember what percent yield is? And that's like percent composition, what you're talking about there, five, I think. Oliver? Uh, it's the other way around. So it's the so we call that the what you expect to get the theoretical. Yeah, so this could be called the actual or the uh, experimental. Right, so it's it's what you actually get in lab, it's your lab data, right? The bottom here, the theoretical numbers coming from the, the stoichiometry, the math. Okay. Well, if everything goes to plan and everything goes great, hey, you get this much amount out. Okay. And you know, percent yield doesn't really 100% doesn't mean like oh that was like that's a great yield or something. But a lot of reactions don't necessarily do that because it just doesn't work out that same way because of the technique and etc. So like when I was doing undergraduate research uh, to get into this organic chemistry lab, uh, you had to do a particular set of reactions and your product at the end had to be greater than like 30% yield. You, and you would get like two or three shots at it and if you couldn't get that, you couldn't be in the group. Okay? So because you had poor lab technique and it just wasn't going to work out for you. It's kind of like how the professor used this stuff because it's something that it was a very common uh, procedure that we had to do and stuff. So I made it into the group, right? If you got like percent yield, you're killing it, right? Right. So I think I got like 42 or something like that the first time I did it. That was the first time I did it, so I was in right. I was in like Flynn after the first time, so I was done. And then I could actually move on to other stuff. But yeah, so there you go. Oh, that was actually as an undergrad. So, yeah, that was a while ago, a long time ago. And I need to move this page down and grab a hold of it. I'm not sure I will be able to. Oh, man. Uh, time for this. I'll be recorded. Your viewing pleasure later. Okay, here we go. All right. So now we're ready. All right, so let's do this problem here. So, nitrogen gas can be prepared by passing gaseous ammonia. So, ammonia is NH3 uh, over solid copper 2 oxide. At high temperature, so we're going to make nitrogen gas. Uh, other products and reactions are solid copper and water vapor. So I'm just going to get rolling on this right away. 
uh, to make this happen very quickly. So that's two, three, six, so put a three. Three. Um, three. I think that's balanced. Yeah, okay. So the way to do limiting reactant problems, there are a number of different ways to do this, right? But the way I found there's a couple, well, the one that seems to work most for students is taking both reactants, okay? That's how you know it's a limiting reactant problem is when they give you, in this case, we got 18.1 grams of uh, ammonia and we got 90.4 grams of uh, copper oxide. So when they give you both reactants, that's telling you right there this is a limiting reactant problem, okay? You're going to need to work at minimum two stoic problems or stoic sets here, all right? So what I would do is I would take each reactant, 18.1 grams, for example, of ammonia, and our 90.4 grams of copper oxide. And in this case, we're looking for mass of nitrogen. So they want to know what the mass of uh, nitrogen is here that we can make. So we're solving both of these for grams of N2. And what we want to find out is which one produces the least amount. Whichever one produces the least amount of product is our limiting reactant because the reaction stops after we use it all up, okay? So it's that simple. All right, so we just got to set up three, two straight problems, figure that out. I'll just work on that for a couple minutes, and then I'll try and get through. Let you set that up a little bit. Okay, so How many grams is copper oxide? 70? So this one has got to be the 10.6 grams. It is? Okay. Okay, so... Here in this case, copper oxide is the limiting reactant, right? It produces the least amount of products. Okay. See you guys tomorrow.